I've killed brothers of the Night's Watch. So, sorry, sorry. Bad Jon Snow impression. Hello Ice and Fire nerds, this is Chris and this is going to continue our Game of Thrones foreshadowing series. We'll pick up where we left off in Part 7 in Season 1, Episode 3, Lord Snow. Alright, as we continue where we left off in Episode 3, Lord Snow, Ned says this to Arya. But now winter is truly coming, and in the winter, we must protect ourselves. Yes it is, Ned, yes it is. So I do think this is a play off the words of how stark here winter is coming. As I said in the Dragon Raised by Wolves series as far as the end game in Jon Snow, I think this hints a little bit at the true meaning of these words and how it used to be an actual threat related to the White Walkers and the link to the Stark bloodline as far as what winter is coming actually means. And during that same conversation right before Ned leaves, he says, If you want to own a sword, you better know how to use it. And this is a bit of a stretch, but I think it kind of points to this later on. That won't help you. We never really see Arya use Needle that much as far as her kill list, but we do see her kill the most important person of all, the Waif, in her journey to go back to Westeros, which I think we'll see in Season 7. But the point being here that this certainly continues the theme of Arya going down this dark path. And then the next scene, we're back at Winterfell, and we see... Don't listen to it. Crows are all liars. And of course, old Nan saying here, don't listen to him, crows are all liars. I think this probably points to Bloodraven. I'm not one in the camp who thinks that Bloodraven is some kind of secret bad guy, as far as him and the children of the force, for that matter, getting revenge on man, you know, being the bad guys behind the scenes, as far as creating the White Walkers to purposely wipe out humankind. I think that was the intent a long, long time ago. But the point being here, that Bloodraven is keeping a few things from Bran, and that is this line. He heard me. Maybe. Maybe he heard the wind. He heard me. The past is already written. The ink is dry. So I definitely think Bloodraven is lying to Bran here, not to just pointlessly deceive him, but to keep him from screwing shit up. Because obviously we see that Bran can change the past with this Tower of Joy scene. He obviously changes the past, so now every time he goes back there, Ned will always turn around and see nobody because he heard Bran say father. And then of course we have the story from old Nan. Oh, my sweet summer child. What do you know about fear? Fear is for the winter, when the snows fall a hundred feet deep. Fear is for the long night, all in darkness. That is the time for fear, my little lord, when the white walkers move through the woods. Now, I guess you could say this is foreshadowing in the sense that it's basically telling us what's going to happen again, or likely going to happen, but I just like hearing this damn story. And then in the same scene, we see Rob walk in at the end of this scary story and say, one time she told me, the sky is blue because we live inside the eye of a blue-eyed giant named Macumba. And of course, Bran replies, Maybe we do. So Old Nan is known to be pretty damn accurate in her stories, but I hope she's wrong on this one. Do not end this like this, George. Do not end this show in the eyeball of a damn giant. And in the same scene, we see this exchange between Rob and Bran. I'd rather be dead. Don't ever say that. I'd rather be dead. So this has not been paid off yet. He says he would rather be dead. Obviously right now in this context of the scene, he's referring to the fact he no longer has the use of his legs and he wanted to be a knight. He wanted to ride horses and be a warrior like his brothers. Now, of course, later on, he ends up being a different type of warrior, very, very important. But I'm just wondering if this scene has not been paid off yet. But could this be paid off later, perhaps in season eight, with you know perhaps the death of Bran in some way because he has to sacrifice himself? Could he be the sacrifice? Now, if you haven't seen my Dragon Raised by Wolves Part Four video with James from Daily Use to Sports Trivia, please check that out. That is the series we did, the four-part series on Jon Snow and basically the ending of Game of Thrones. It was specifically geared towards Jon in his end game. But that's basically the end game of the whole entire show or the whole entire book series. Anyway, I think there has to be a sacrifice as far as a bittersweet ending. 
and Brand could very well be the one to do that. So when you go see that prediction there as far as how I think it might end, one possibility at least, perhaps he's the one who has to sacrifice himself. And of course I hope it doesn't, but it's not going to be a pretty ending. And in our next scene at Castle Black, we see Lord Snow kicking ass and taking names. Well, Lord Snow, it appears you're the least useless person here. But I guess it could foreshadow his rise to power as far as going up the ranks a little bit and becoming Lord Commander, being assigned as a steward to Lord Commander Mormont when he wanted to be a ranger. And just for a quick little history lesson here, if you're not familiar with the book series and some of the backstory of A Song of Ice and Fire, Alistair Thorne is at the wall because he fought on the side of the Targaryens during Robert's Rebellion. So he was a Targaryen supporter, and I kind of really wanted him to find out at the end of all this before he died and John hung him, who John really was. And in the following scene, we see Littlefinger take Ned to see Catelyn. You're a funny man. Huh? A very funny man. Ned! So Ned proceeds to choke the shit out of Peter Baelish in front of everybody. I would say it was a little bit awkward and embarrassing for Lord Baelish. So I think it was kind of the first sign of things to come when Peter probably got back at him doing this. I did warn you not to trust me. Now there's plenty more scenes to foreshadow that particular scene there as far as Littlefinger betraying Ned, but we'll get to those when we get to those episodes. And in our next scene, we see Tyrion walk in on Jon as he's about to get his damn throat slit by his newfound buddies in the Night's Watch. It's an improvement. <laughs> Your brother Bran has woken up. So the interesting line here is that Tyrion hands Jon the note from the Raven from Winterfell, and it's the news that Bran is alive, but he'll never walk again, obviously. And he says to Jon, your little brother, he's woken up. So I think this is obviously literal in the sense that Bran has actually woken up from his coma, but figuratively he's woken up to start his path on becoming the next three-eyed Raven. And then, of course, in the same scene, we see John and Tyrion continue their dialogue, and John says this. Everybody knew what this place was, and no one told me. No one but you. My father knew, and he left me to rot at the wall all the same. So yes, technically, Ned probably knew that Night's Watch had been in decline over the years. So John, he did it to protect your ass, have a little respect, I'm sure you'll find that out later. At least I hope so. And I guess you could say since he used the words rot at the wall, technically he does rot at the wall for a little while. And next we go back to King's Landing and we have the conversation between Ned, Catelyn, and Peter once they finally got into the brothel and he stopped choking him outside in front of everybody embarrassing the shit out of him. Damn, that was a mouthful. Peter has promised to help us find the truth. He's like a little brother to me, Ned. He would never betray my trust. And what does Littlefinger do? I did warn you not to trust me. He betrays the shit out of her trust. And then as Catelyn heads out to go back home to Winterfell, Ned and her have a little goodbye talk. You watch yourself on the road, huh? That temper of yours is a dangerous thing. My temper? <laughs> Gods be good. You nearly killed her little finger yesterday. <laughs> so Ned tells Catelyn here basically, watch out on the road, that temper years will get you in trouble. And in fact, it sure does, and because she starts this whole damn mess by doing this. This man came into my house as a guest, and there conspired to murder my son. I call upon you to seize him and help me return him to Winterfell to await the king's justice. <laughs> 
So she captures Tyrion due to her temper and essentially starts this whole damn war because of what Littlefinger said without any real proof. All right, in our next scene, we're introduced to Sir Barristan Selmy and Robert as they tell their war stories. They never tell you how they all shit themselves. They don't put that part in the songs. Stupid boy. What about Aerys Targaryen? What did the Mad King say when you stabbed him in the back? He said the same thing he'd been saying for hours. Burn them all. So basically this is a little more character development for Robert, for example. We find out that Robert's not really a bad guy, he's just a bad king. We introduced to Sir Barristan and Selmy. But more importantly here, we hear Jamie and his backstory about the Mad King. And at this point in the story, we're also wondering, what is this all about him killing this king? We've heard it brought up a couple times now. Ned's already brought it to our attention earlier in the throne room. And now we're hearing it again from Robert and Jamie himself. And of course, that leads to the details here. Burn them all. Burn them in their homes, burn them in their beds. Commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women, and children prepared a life. Would you have done it? And in the very same scene, we're introduced to Lanso Lannister. Lanso. Gods, what a stupid name. Lanso Lannister. Who named you? Some half wit with a stutter <sighs> so robert introduces us to lancel lannister and kind of makes fun of him gives him a little roast in here as far as his name goes now what's interesting here is while he's roasting him in front of everybody and basically embarrassing this poor kid he is pouring his wine and of course later on he does this more wine your grace So he gets a little payback on King Robert here due to Cersei, of course, pouring him some wine. Payback's a bitch. King Robert Baratheon, murdered by a pig. All right, guys, so that'll do it for this episode. Let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll pick up right where we left off in episode nine. Anyway, guys, as usual, thank you for all the support, especially to you guys on Patreon. A special shout out, as usual, to my Patreon executive smokescreen producers, Volga10, Lala Gig, and Kisa Powell. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe to get everything and make sure you hit that little notification bell so you're notified when I drop a video. And also, if you have been subscribed, make sure you're still subscribed. So thanks, guys. Really appreciate the support. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.